This is a, a workshop on um, why is apostolic authority so important. Uh, if this, was, uh, this talk was given in uh, Brazil or um, uh, Africa or in, uh, in countries where there are strong apostolic movements, then this talk would be very different. But I'm, I'm giving this talk in, uh, in Europe, and I would like to address challenges that are specific to Europe. So why is apostolic authority so important? That is the question. And from the very beginning, I give you my answer, which is the evangelical answer. Um, apostolic authority is so important because apostolic authority is the foundation of the church. So we are talking about foundations. And uh, we know that when, there is, when a house doesn't have a foundation, that ho house collapses. So uh, the, the stakes are very high. And also because apostolic authority determines the normative teaching of the church. So this is my, my answer in a nutshell. Apostolic authority is the link between Jesus and the New Testament. And it is a legitimate authority, apostolic authority, because it comes from the authorization of Jesus. So it is legitimate authority because Jesus, our Lord, authorized the apostles. It is also a reliable authority because we have good historical reasons to trust the witness of the apostles. And it was also normative authority because the, the tradition of the apostles is the new covenant word of God to us. So this is, this is my answer, the evangelical answer in a nutshell. And the outline of my talk uh, is this. First, I would like to ask the question, does the church have a foundation? Secondly, I would like to argue that we have good evidences that the church does have a foundation and it is an apostolic foundation. Uh, then I would like to talk about whether this foundation, the apostolic foundation, is a reliable foundation and then draw some conclusions. Um, this, is, this presentation is going to be non-scholarly, uh, but it is based on scholarship. So you can... I, I, I simplified a lot of things, but this is the uh, part of the, uh, uh, the dissertation that I'm, I'm just about finishing. So there is a lot of uh, research behind it, but I, I try to speak about this in an accessible way. So those of you who are not theologians or um, thinking about these things day and night like me can also uh, uh, follow me easily. So the question, does the church have a foundation? There are two kinds of challenges to this statement, that the church has a foundation, an apostolic foundation. And the first challenge is the Roman Catholic challenge. Um, according to Roman Catholic theology, the church was built on Peter, St. Peter, who is called the rock. Tu es Petrus. This is, uh, I think, from... Uh, from St. Peter's. You are Peter, and I built my church on this rock. Now, we have to understand that many Protestants think that, yes, Peter is the rock. Uh, I put here some examples for uh, um, evangelicals uh, saying that Peter is the rock. Oskar Kuhlmann, German theologian, wrote a book, uh, Peter, Disciple, Apostle, Martyr, uh, in which he argues, and I think he makes a very strong argument, that, it, that in that sentence, it is indeed Peter who is claimed to be the rock. Uh, he was liked by Roman Catholics. He was invited to Vatican II. But uh, I'm not sure Catholics always realized that his whole thesis totally undermines uh, the papacy. Uh, Martin Hengel, Marcus Bochmiel. Uh, last year, Hans Bayer was one of the uh, speakers. He was, he was a New Testament professor of mine. He also 
claims that it is Peter who is the rock. And even D.A. Carson uh, uh, argues that exegetically that's the right conclusion, that Peter is the rock. But that's not the real question. The real question and the real challenge of the Roman Catholic uh, position is that they believe that Peter's role was perpetuated in the bishops of Rome. So that our main uh, quarrel with Roman Catholics is not whether Peter is the rock or not. Um, in some sense, Peter as confessor and representatives of the apostles can be seen as, uh, as, as foundational to the church. But in, in the Roman Catholic view, Peter's role was perpetuated uh, in the bishops of Rome, and this is the doctrine of apostolic succession, which uh, ensures that the church itself is perceived as the apostolic foundation. Now, why is this a challenge? In Roman Catholic theology and, and practice, the normative teaching of the church is taught by the Holy Scriptures, the Holy Tradition, and the official magisterial interpretation of both. And the result is that the church, if, if, if it's the, the authority for itself, it can easily drift away from the teaching of the apostles um, by its own web of infallible interpretations. And a good example of this is Mariology. We all received a copy of uh, Leonardo da Chirico's uh, new book on Mary. In this booklet, he shows us how, for example, in, um, in the area of, uh, of uh, what the church teaches about Mary, this drift has taken place, slowly, incrementally, but uh, without the possibility of real self-correction, because it, it, by its own weight, it's, it's going on and on. So that is, the, that is the, uh, the Roman Catholic challenge. And the other big challenge that we face is um, the liberal challenge. And I would like to show you two sides of this challenge. One is form criticism. Those who have studied or learned uh, theology know what form criticism is. In, in a nutshell, um, this, this is a popular method in New Testament studies, which totally dominated the 20th century New Testament studies, which was originally developed by Ru Rudolf Bultmann and Martin Dibelius. And this method assumes that the uh, the stories and the sayings of Jesus were preserved in, uh, in, in certain kind of forms, uh, pre-set forms like parables or miracle stories. And they had their certain uh, characteristics and they could uh, remain and then uh, pass on anonymously. So there are these stories and sayings in certain forms and they were passed on anonymously from community to community. And when it got to certain uh, communities, so there is a saying tradition or a parable, like the parable of the sower. Uh, it, it reached a community of, of so-called Christians, and they had their own concerns, their own agenda, and they reshaped these stories and then passed it on. And the Gospels... Uh, Zitzim Leben is a is, is a, uh, favorite uh, expression of the form critical approach. The the life situation of the community that received the saying, and then the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, were compiled of these reshaped uh, traditions, these reshaped stories and and sayings. So here's a, here's another uh, illustration of this. So there is here's the historical Jesus. We know very little about the historical Jesus. But we know, or we assume, rather assume, that there were these traditions floating around, these sayings. Here's a saying about um, a prodigal son. Jesus is supposed to speak about it. Or a story about uh, a lame man being healed. And, and those kinds of things. And a saying about the kingdom of God. And then these were passed on anonymously. They were floating around in, in, the, in the first century. 
and then a community hears it and reshapes it and passes on, and the Gospels were compiled from these stories, picking from these stories. Now, why is it a challenge to um, the foundations of the church? Because if its assumptions are true, we cannot have access to reliable tradition about the life and words of Jesus. We don't know which words are his and which words are put into his mouth. There's a, 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 a very famous uh, um, a teamwork in New Testament studies called the Jesus Seminar. Uh, the single purpose of this was to uh, find out which words from uh, set, really said by Jesus and which words were, words were just put into his mouth by later Christian communities. If this, is, uh, if this is true, we don't know what Jesus claimed to be or what just uh, was claimed by his followers. Did Jesus ever claim to be the Messiah? Did Jesus ever claim to be the Son of God or God himself? We don't know. We are in a fog when it comes to truth about Jesus. We try to dig into this thing down there, but we don't really have access to it. This is a huge challenge to the Christian faith. I wonder whether the decline of Western denominations is due to this. Because if we are in uncertainty about what our Lord said, or whether he was a Lord at all, we are just in a fog. The, the other side of the liberal challenge is what uh, we can call pluralism. Pluralism is a... <clears throat> It has various forms, uh, but the, the pioneer work was uh, written by Walter Bauer, a German theologian, called The Orth Orthodoxy and Heresy in Earliest Christianity. That was the book that influenced uh, many others who wrote books like uh, uh, Helmut Köster, Elaine Pagels. How do you pronounce this guy's name? Yes. But he was also uh, influenced by the idea of pluralism within the New Testament. Uh, and, but the most famous one is Bart Ehrman, who wrote several books. You can feel the title, Misquoting Jesus, who, who misquoted Jesus, the gospel writers. Orthodox, the orthodox corruption of scripture, forged, lost Christianities. This is a very telling title. What he's saying is that um, there were many different kinds of Christianities in, in the first and second centuries. And one version of Christianity, what we call, or who call themselves the Orthodox, won. And basically uh, got rid of the evidence that there were other sorts of Christianity. Um, Bauer's original thesis was that heresy preceded orthodoxy, but at least they, they lived uh, side by side each other. Uh, the, the irony of, of his work is orthodoxy and heresy in earliest Christianity, the evidence that he doesn't deal with is the New Testament, which is the earliest evidence of Christianity. Why is pluralism a challenge? Because if it is true, there is no normative tradition for the church. Gnosticism, which claims that there are two gods, there is a, uh, a, a creator god, and there is the god of uh, Jesus Christ. Uh, that view, which says the Old Testament god is, a, is, a, is a, an evil god, but the god of Jesus Christ is a good god. Um, they are just as legit legitimate versions of Christianity. Jesus can be God or not God, a real man, or he can just seem to be a man. And the way of salvation can be either what we claim uh, by grace through faith, or it can be legalistic, or it can be even uh, a, a recognition that we are somehow God. So these are legitimate versions of Christianity, and they were side by side in in the beginning, according to the pluralist claim. And even, as I said, the, the unity of the New Testament is questioned by some. Now, this is a big, big problem 
because anything goes, basically, that we can find a precedent somewhere in the first and second centuries. So I would like to um, argue for the apostolic foundation of the Christian faith. And I would like to present uh, four kinds of evidence that it is not true that there were legitimate um, versions of very different kinds of Christianities in the beginning. It is not true that we cannot have access to the earliest, uh, uh, to the historical Jesus. Uh, so I would like to offer some evidence. The first evidence is the New Testament evidence. As I said, uh, Bauer didn't deal with the New Testament evidence, but the New Testament documents are the earliest Christian documents. So when we read the New Testament documents, we read the earliest available, it is available, the earliest available testimony of Christians. All of the documents in the New Testament, or the 27 books in the New Testament, we, we have good reasons to believe were written in the first century. And none of the Gnostic groups, uh, Gnostic writings have a good evidence for being written in the first century. So this is a very, very uh, historically very strong source. And when we read the New Testament, then we see that these documents testify to apostolic authority. Let me give you some examples. In um, the Gospel of Luke, this is what we read. And when they came, he called his disciples and chose from them twelve whom he named apostles. Simon, whom he named Peter, and Andrew, his brother, and James, and John, and Philip, and Bartholo Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who was called the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. This is being repeated, the same guys, in all the Gospels. This is uh, a very good evidence that uh, the church, the early church, had a memory of 12 guys, 12 guys who knew Jesus and uh, were authorized by him as apostles. In, a, in um, Ephesians 2.20, the apostle Paul writes this, so then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. And there are many debates what the prophets mean in this uh, context. Is it the Old Testament prophets or maybe those who proclaim the message of the apostles? But certainly the, the apostles are seen as uh, foundational. Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. So the apostles are foundational to the building of the church, the holy temple of the Lord. Uh, this is an interesting picture, uh, not this one, although this one is nice too, but what John, John uh, uses, applies, he says, and the wall of the city, the new Jerusalem, which I believe represents the church, the church of Jesus Christ. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So he says clearly that the foundation of the church are the 12 apostles. Now, the book of Acts itself is... Um, is, is interesting. In, in my language, we call it the Acts of the Apostles. And I don't know if you, in your Bibles, in your languages, it's called, is it called the Acts of the Apostles? Uh -huh. Actually, two apostles. Two apostles. Two apostles. Yeah. Does, actually, does the, actually. Yeah, okay, yeah, because the name of the book is uh, the Acts of the Apostles. Uh, it is itself a testimony uh, to the fact that the early church viewed the apostles as is very significant for the church. We find many verses that say, and by the hands of the apostles, and then the apostles. He, he talks about all the believers, but emphasizes the apostles. The apostles have a significant role, and especially, as you said it very well, uh, the apostle Peter and Paul. So um, 
you can make a claim that the first 12 chapters are basically about Peter's role in the early church. And from chapter 13 on, it's the apostle Paul, Peter and Paul. And in the Jerusalem church, we read in Acts 2.22, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Then um, here are three texts uh, how Paul, the Apostle Paul, viewed his own apostolic authority. Uh, to the Thessalonian church, he writes, So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. So our spoken word and our letter is the tradition. Hold fast to that. Uh, in the same letter, he writes, Now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you received from us. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 14, 37, 38, uh, he says, If anyone thinks that he is a prophet or spiritual, uh, this would be a very important uh, verse for those who... Uh, want to um, discard ap apostolic authority based on spiritual revelation. We don't need apostolic teaching. We receive it directly from the Lord. He says, if anyone thinks that he is a prophet or a spiritual, he should acknowledge that the things I am writing to you are a command of the Lord. If anyone does not recognize this, he is not recognized. Very strong language. Let's uh, move on to the second kind of evidence, evidence from the fathers. By fathers, I mean the, the early, especially the early fathers of the church, uh, bishops and, and theologians and apologists of the uh, first and second centuries. Uh, the earliest of them is Clement of Rome. He was a, a leader in the Church of Rome, and uh, according to historians, he wrote his letter to the, uh, to the Corinthians around or in uh, AD 96. So it's a very early, very early uh, witness. Uh, Clement of Rome says, but not to dwell upon ancient examples, let us come to the most recent spiritual heroes. Who are the most recent spiritual heroes? Let us take the noble examples furnished in our own generation. So it's, it's, it's within the time of those people. Through envy and jealousy, the greatest and most righteous pillars of the church have been persecuted and put to death. Let us set before our eyes the illustrious, example, the illustrious apostles, Peter, through unrighteous envy and endured not one or two, but numerous labors. And when he had finally suffered martyrdom, departed to the place of glory due to him. Owing to envy, Paul, so his other example is Paul, interestingly, like in the book of Acts, Peter and Paul. Paul also obtained the reward of patient endurance after being seven times thrown into captivity compared to flea and stoned. After preaching both in the East and West, he gained the illustrious reputation due to his faith, having taught righteousness to the whole world and come to the extreme limit of the West, maybe Spain, and suffered martyrdom under the prefects. Thus was he removed from the world and went into the holy place, having proved himself a striking example of patience. So he clearly thinks that uh, the apostles, especially Peter and Paul, were illustrious examples and heroes. Papias of Hierapolis, a bishop of Hierapolis, uh, late first century, early second century, he wrote this. But I shall not hesitate. This is a very famous quotation because they're one of the earliest after the apostolic age. But I shall not hesitate also to put down for you, along with my interpretations, whatsoever things I have at any time learned carefully from the elders and carefully remembered, guaranteeing their truth. For I did not, like the multitude, take pleasure in those that speak much, but in those that teach the truth. So Papias wants to know what is the truth about Jesus. What did he really say? Because there are things that people say, but I want to know the truth. 
So who is he turning to? What, who tells the truth? If then anyone came who had been a follower of the elders, I questioned him in regard to the words of the elders, what Andrew or what Peter said, or what was said by Philip or by Thomas or by James. Do you recognize the names? Or by John or by Matthew or by any other of the disciples of the Lord. And what things Aristion and the presbyter John, this, there is a lot of discussions on this, what, what it exactly means. I believe he is referring to the apostle John. And I, I make elsewhere an argument for this. The disciples of the Lord say, For I did not think that what was to be gotten from the books would profit me as much as what came from the living and abiding voice. So they were still alive, or some of them. I, I think Aristion and John were still alive, and could, um, uh, Papias could talk to them personally. Uh, and he could talk to people who, who uh, had known uh, these other apostles. And he wanted to know what they say. So what, what is that which they remembered about the words of Jesus? Because that's the truth. That's the reliable truth. Ignatius of Antioch, um, he was taken as, as a captive to Rome uh, and was finally eaten by lions. And uh, on the way there, he sent out seven letters to chur churches. He was also a, a bishop in Antioch. And he, he writes, I do not, by the way, bishop meant pastor like that. I do not, as Peter and Paul, issue commandments unto you. They were apostles of Jesus Christ, but I am the very least of believers. He makes a clear distinction. Although he's a bishop, he makes a clear distinction between himself and the apostles. Very early on, so in the early second century, just after the apostolic age. To, uh, this he writes in his letter to the Romans. In his letter to the Trallians, he writes, but shall I, when permitted to write on this point, reach such a height of self-esteem, such a height of self-esteem, that though being a condemned man, I should issue a command to you as if I were an apostle. He, he no, clearly knows, I am not an apostle. I cannot command you like an apostle. I, I, in the same letter he writes, I exhort you therefore, yet not I, but the love of Jesus Christ, take ye only Christian food and abstain from strange herbage, which is heresy. So he's ta talking about teaching, not normal food. And this will surely be, if ye be not puffed up and if ye be inseparable from God, Jesus, uh, Jesus Christ, and from the bishop and from the ordinances of the apostles. So you eat garbage when you don't listen to the ordinances of the apostles. Polycarp was a contemporary of Papias and Ignatius. Um, he was uh, martyred. He was uh, burned alive. And this is what he writes uh, to the Philippian church. For neither am I nor is any other like me. By the way, if you, if you read the, the, the letter to the Philippians, Paul's letter to the Philippians, and you want to know what happened after that, because we don't, we don't know what happened after that. Read the letter of Polycarp. Same church. So, for neither am I, nor is any other like me, able to follow the wisdom of the blessed and glorious Paul. Then you, the apostle Paul, who, when he was among you in the presence of the men of that time, taught accurately and steadfastly the word of truth. And also when he was absent, wrote letters to you from the study of which you will be able to build yourselves up into the, into the faith given you. In the same letter he writes, so then let us serve him with fear and all reverence as he himself commanded us and as did the apostles who brought us the gospel and the prophets who foretold the coming of our Lord. Let us be zealous for good, refraining from offense and from the false brethren and from those who bear the name of the Lord in hypocrisy who deceive empty-minded men. The apostles brought us the gospel. Justin Martyr, he was also killed in Rome, a philosopher who became a Christian. Justin Martyr writes about the memoirs composed by or the memoirs of the apostles. He mentions, mentions that most likely referring to the Gospels. 
Irenaeus, uh, the end of the second century, uh, this is what he writes in his uh, Against Heresies, in his book Against Heresies. We have learned from none other the plan of our salvation than from those through whom the gospel has come down to us, which they did at one time proclaim in public and at a later period by the will of God handed down to us in scriptures, in the scriptures. Now, this is very significant. So they proclaimed it publicly when, before they died and wrote it down. And what they wrote down, says Irenaeus in the second century, became scripture. to be the ground and pillar of our faith. And then he writes other things. I will not uh, read the whole thing here. And then he mentions specifically the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel of uh, uh, Luke, the Gospel of Mark, the Gospel of uh, John. And he writes some things about how uh, they were written. Behind the Gospel of Mark was the authority of Peter. Behind the Gospel of Luke was the authority of Paul. Clement of Alexandria in the second century uh, uses the image of uh, a meadow. So if you are tired and uh, sleepy and uh, um, fed up with intellectual stuff, then imagine a beautiful meadow with flowers. Uh, what do you call those red flowers that are now growing? Pipoch? What are those? Poppies. Poppies, yeah. Uh, those, um, so imagine those. And he says, uh, he talks about a certain guy who, um, like a Sicilian bee, is uh, gathering the, the sap, the, the spoil of the flowers. And this is what a, a good Christian does. We, we are uh, gathering the tradition, which is really healthy, from the apostles. And then he mentions four, Peter, James, John, and Paul. Um, Paul calls these three the pillars in Galatians. And he calls it the dep uh, deposit of ancestral and apostolic seeds. And the blessed tradition that came from the apostles, especially those four. Uh, Tertullian, end of the second century, wrote a book. It's called Prescription Against Heretics. It's a long argument. It's worth reading it. It's very easy to understand, very logical. He, he writes this book uh, as a long argument that the true teaching of the church is that which the apostles preached. And this teaching, says uh, Tertullian, is preserved in the scriptures and in the so-called rule of faith. And I would like to speak about these two a little bit. So we have seen the evidence from the New Testament that there was an apostolic foundation. We have seen the evidence from the fathers. And now uh, I would like to show you why the New Testament canon is an evidence. And then we will speak a little bit about the rule of faith. The New Testament canon, by which we mean the 27 books in the New Testament, or when it was still not 27, because there was, there was some discussion whether the whether Second John or Third John or uh, the book of Revelation or Hebrews or G Jude or James were part of it, at least 22 books uh, functioned as a, as a canon very early. And uh, this is an important evidence for the apostolic foundation. Why? First, because the primary uh, criterion that they used for whether a book should be seen as part of the canon of the scriptures, part of the, um, the word of God, was apostolicity. Uh, is it written by an apostle or by an apostolic man, like Luke, who was a companion of Paul, or Mark, who was an interpreter of Peter? Uh, and was it written during the time of the apostles so that they could check it, whether it's, a, it's really their tradition? Uh, there was a discussion on a, a certain book called Paul and Thecla. 
And one of the arguments against that book was it was written just a generation ago in the second century. They said, we know who wrote it. And it wasn't an apostle. It wasn't near an apostle. It was written in our times. It cannot be part of the canon. Secondly, the, the canon of the New Testament demarcates the tradition of the apostles and, and divides it from later church traditions. So, uh, and, and, and when, when you talk to Roman Catholics, you can um, refer to the, remind them that even you demar demarcate, I mean, your fathers demarcate the uh, tradition of the apostles from late, later church tradition. The New Testament canon is a witness and evidence to the demarcation of the tradition of the apostles. And thirdly, the canon is called scripture. We have seen a, an example in Irenaeus, but we can go even earlier in, in the second letter of Peter. Peter, uh, Peter or the author of the letter him, uh, himself, who I, I think is Peter, but uh, many, many scholars don't believe that. He refers back to the letters of Paul and says that uh, Paul's letters are like Old Testament scriptures. Uh, there's no other way, really, to understand, to interpret what he says, that he considers the letters of Paul as scripture. But later church traditions are not called scripture. This is another evidence that uh, there was an apostolic foundation. And then I mentioned the rule of faith. Um, it's, it's, in Latin, it's, it's called the regula fidei, or... Uh, in plur plural, the regule fidei. Uh, most fathers of the church, Irenaeus, Tertullian, Clement of Alexandria, Origen, Hippolytus, summarized the apostolic tradition in what they called the rule of faith. So it, it was a summary of the apostolic tradition, of, of the teaching of the scriptures. It wasn't an addition to the scriptures. They, it was very clear that they summarized the teaching of the scriptures. It's not another authority beside the scriptures. But it was used like a creed that summarizes the, the teaching of the apostles, the teaching of the, the scriptures, and is used as a, a measuring rod for its interpretation. Why? Because this is how the apostles, in memory, summarized the belief. So that was a... Uh, a, a memory passed down of what the apostles emphasized, and that's the rule of faith. Here is an example of, of what the rule of faith uh, looked like uh, from Irenaeus, but I could use other examples because it's, it's never the same, but its basic structure is the same. The church, says uh, Irenaeus, through, uh, though dispersed throughout the whole world, even to the ends of the earth, has received from the apostles and their disciples this faith. And then he summarizes it. She, the church, believes in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are in them, and in one Christ Jesus, the Son of God, who became incarnate for our salvation, and in the Holy Spirit. If someone tells you, the Trinity was invented in the um, Council of Nicaea or something like that. <coughs> it's, it's just not true. Uh, Irenaeus is already summarizing the Trinity. It's a Trinitarian faith, which obviously goes back to the apostles. You find it in the New Testament everywhere. And the Holy Spirit, who proclaimed through the, through the prophets the dispensation of, of dispensations of God, and the advance and the birth from the virgin and the passion and the resurrection from the dead and the ascension into heaven in the flesh of the beloved Christ Jesus our Lord and his future manifestation from heaven in the glory of the Father to gather all things in one and to raise up a new all flesh of the whole human race in order that to Christ Jesus our Lord and God and Savior and King according to the will of the invisible Father every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess to him and that he should execute last judgment towards all 
that he may send spiritual wickedness and the angels who transgressed and became apostates together with the ungodly and unrighteous and wicked and profane among men into everlasting fire. But may, in the exercise of his grace, confer immortality on the righteous and holy and those who have kept his commandments and have preserved in his love some from the beginning of their Christian course and others from the date of their repentance and may surround them with everlasting glory. This is just one example of a summary of the doctrine of the apostles. And it's, it's, it's everywhere in early Christian literature. Another evidence that there was an apostolic foundation. So the existence of an apostolic foundation is evidenced, and this is my summary now, up until now. The New Testament picture of the apostles, the writings of the fathers, the existence of a canon of the New Testament, and the existence of the rule of faith. Okay, the question is, is the apostolic foundation reliable? So are we talking about a reliable foundation? There are two groundbreaking uh, works that were published in the second half of the 20th century, or early, actually early 20th century, the, the other one. You, I, I will show you other books as well, but these two books are, as, are especially significant because they shook the foundations of the form critical approach and the pluralistic view of, uh, of origins, Christian origins. This, this is the same book. Uh, this is uh, the doctoral work of Birger Gerhardsen, a Swedish uh, theologian called Memory and Manuscript. This was published in 1961. When this book appeared, it got a devastating critique, uh, especially from a, a, a scholar in Judaism whose name was Morton Smith and also his disciple, uh, Jacob Neusner. Jacob Neusner is one of the living, uh, best known living authorities of Judaism right now. And Jacob Neusner and Morton Smith attacked this work, and because of their attack, it was basically dismissed for a long time. There were some people who referred to it and thought it was groundbreaking, but it was mis dismissed by the majority of scholarship. Up until 1998, when it was republished. And when it was republished, one of the surprises was that the foreword was written by Jacob Neusner. And he said, literally he said, uh, I write this foreword as an act of penance. Uh, I am sorry, I repent. I was wrong. This is an excellent book. I agree with it. It's, it's totally true. And, uh, and then he criticizes his doctor father, father, father uh, Morton Smith, who was found out to be, found to be forging a document of Clement of Rome. He by that time claimed that Jesus was a, basically a cynic sage, cynic teacher, probably homosexual. And uh, Jake, Jacob Neusner says, no, I, I was influenced by Morton Smith. He was wrong. B uh, Gerhardson is right. And, and then his work just got off the uh, ground and, and took off the ground and, and got very, very influential. Uh, his main thesis, uh, I, I will come back to this. The other work that was really groundbreaking is Richard Bauckham's Jesus and the Eyewitnesses. It was published in 2006. And uh, he uh, makes a very strong case that the New Testament is based on eyewitness testimony. What we have is firsthand eyewitness testimony. And uh, his argument is very powerful. Uh, and many other works followed uh, on this uh, track. Uh, Rainer Isner called, uh, wrote a book, Jesus as Lera, Jesus as a teacher. Um, a, um, an edited work of many books in uh, honor of Birger Gerhardson by uh, Werner Kelber, very influential New Testament scholar, and Samuel Bierskok, who also wrote other books, uh, which um, is in the same school of thought, uh, criticizing the form-critical approach 
Uh, Gerhard Zon wrote three other books uh, published together as the reliability of the gospel tradition. Uh, this is my uh, doctor father, Peter Bola, who wrote uh, Challenges to New Testament Theology. Uh, his main uh, conversion partner is uh, Heike Reisenen, however you pronounce it. And uh, these two books uh, are quite recent by Michael, Michael Kruger. Canon Revisited, The Heresy of Orthodoxy, by, written together with Andreas Kustenberger. Uh, even the title is very telling. Uh, if you remember, Walter Bauer's book, uh, book was titled um, um, Heresy and Orthodoxy in the earliest, in earliest Christianity. This is the heresy of, of orthodoxy. So it's, uh, it's a heresy to really speak about orthodoxy, and they make a good case that no, there was a strong apostolic foundation, and authority is the tradition of Jesus. So what are the main arguments? I summarize it uh, very quickly. Uh, the main, these are historical arguments, so no, no theology in it. It's just a historical case that there was an apostolic foundation. The form critical approach ignored the fact that the apostles were living and authoritative eyewitnesses. Uh, one of, one uh, scholar said that if the form critics are right, the apostles had to be raptured just after Jesus ascended into heaven. Because it's, it's just unrealistic as a picture that uh, traditions were floating around. No, there were living authoritative eyewitnesses. People could ask them what they experienced. And secondly, the second argument is that there were reliable methods to remember and convey tradition. This is Gerhardson's main um, addition to New Testament scholarship. He's, he studied methods in the first, second centuries of uh, how the Jews passed on tradition. And he proves that they, they had, I mean, this is a fascinating work, they had absolutely reliable methods of transmitting tradition if they wanted to transmit it in a reliable manner, like the Torah, which was holy for them. And we are talking about here of the teachings and acts of a person who the disciples believed was God. And what he said was the word of God. So it's extremely important. It was extremely important for them to remember, and they had ways to remember it. Um, thirdly, the early church did make a distinction between legitimate diversity and illegitimate diversity. Truth and error, orthodoxy and heresy. It's not true. It's simply not true historically that the church didn't care, that there were all kinds of versions of Christianity. There were, but it was illegitimate diversity. I mean, even in the New Testament, we see how Paul reacted to teachings that were contrary to the gospel. And, and finally, the apostles of Jesus Christ, especially Peter, Paul, James, and John, were the guarantors of the true orthodox, reliable tradition. They were seen to be the guarantors that's, I think, what the word elder refers to in uh, Papias's words. I wanted to know what the elders said. The elders, the guarantors of the tradition, the previous generation who still knew the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you, if you, see, if you look at the New Testament, you, can, you see that at least 26 books, but maybe even 27, can be uh, somehow connected to these four Apostles, Peter, Paul, James, and John. Very interesting. Let me add a, a few theological reasons, and then uh, we will stop, and, and um, there will be some time for asking questions or comments. So these were historical arguments, but you can make theological arguments for the fact that there was an apostolic foundation, that the that apostolic authority is foundational to the church. Uh, Hermann Riederbos, a uh, Dutch scholar, argues, and then many others accepted his thesis, and I think it's true, is that the apostolic writings are the authoritative documents 
of, of the new stage in redemptive history. So we should think in terms of redemptive history. God is at work for a long time. And we, there was a covenant made with Abraham and a covenant made with Moses. And, and, and the Jews waited for something, something to, it was not closed. The old, old covenant was not closed. The Jews expected that something else would come. In Jesus, it had come. And the, the apostles were uh, the authoritative writers of this new stage in um, redemptive history. That's why they are uh, very often mentioned together with the prophets, the prophets and the apostles, the apostles and the prophets, prophets, apostles, apostles, prophets, because they are uh, the authoritative uh, writers of the new stage in history. Uh, Michael Kruger and, and Peter Bola, uh, separately from each other, independently, I, I guess, uh, wrote about uh, and made an argument that uh, we can see clues, signs, that the apostles wrote with what they call canon consciousness. They were aware that what they write is authoritative and normative for the new covenant. So there, is an, there, there were acts of God in the old covenant, and then it was written down. The apostles had the same consciousness. There was a new act of God in Jesus Christ, and it had to be memorized, and it had to be interpreted, and that was their role, and they wrote with canon consciousness. Um, Michael Kruger also says that when we, when we talk about the canon of the New Testament, what we often mean is, is the closed canon. So what is, the new, what is the canon of the New Testament? The 27 books. Uh, when do we have the first list of the 27 books, in, in, uh, if we go back and, and read the, the fathers? Most say it's Athanasius, 4th century. That's the first example of the exact same 27 books. Now, it's probably earlier. We have a list in origin that has the same list, but it's still third century. But Kruger says, is the canon really starting when we have a closed canon, when we have the exact same 27 books? No, it's not true. There was a functional canon even earlier, much earlier. We have, in, the, in the second century, we already have a canon. We have a list of books that were seen to be the canon of the New Testament. But, he says, theologically, the canon was born, so the, the, the deposit of apostolic tradition was born uh, the minute the apostles wrote down what they wrote down. Why? Because we believe in the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Uh, there was a uh, a female theologian, Etta Lindemann, who was a, a student of Rudolf Bultmann. He was a form critic. She was a form critic. And, uh, and then she went through a deep uh, conversion experience. And she said, the, the new thing in my theology is that I realized that there is such a thing as inspiration. And the, the fact that she started to believe in inspiration because she started to believe in the supernatural uh, that completely changed her approach to the scriptures because there is a canon from the moment the Holy Spirit inspired those books. They are, they are breathed out by God, uh, as Paul says. So I could elaborate on these, but there are theological arguments also for the why the apostolic foundation is reliable. So let me draw some conclusions and then open up for discussion. First, apostolic authority is not perpetuated, but is once for all. There are no apostles in that sense today. Why? Because they all died. And by nature, they were uh, followers of Jesus in the first century. They were the ones who followed Jesus from the baptism of John uh, and saw his resurrection. Uh, Paul was an exception to this, and he calls himself uh, a man born out of time, so he, he realized that. And therefore, he, uh, he, he received some tradition from the 12. So there are no 
apostles in that sense today. There might be missionaries or church planters who we, we might want to call apostles. It can be confusing. But in, the, in this sense, as foundational, we don't have apostles anymore. Secondly, the witness and teaching of the apostles is historically reliable. We have very good arguments for this, very strong arguments. If we had more time, I could, I could uh, talk about this. Historically, we have good reasons to believe that it is a reliable uh, witness. Thirdly, the authorized apostolic tradition is preserved in the New Testament. The New Testament canon is that which preserves the, the tradition that is authoritative because of the apostles. Fourthly, the apostolic tradition of the scriptures is normative for the church of all ages because it is the teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ. Athanasius summarized it by saying what the, the teaching of the Catholic church from which some departed and therefore became heretics. The teaching of the Catholic, the universal church, is that which the Lord Jesus passed on, the apostles preached, and the fathers preserved. That is the teaching of the church. And finally, the church is under, therefore under the authority of the apostolic scripture. It is not the authority for herself. It is under the authority of the scriptures and therefore should always be corrected and reformed by it. So the reformers were right, and the evangelicals are right. The Catholic challenge can be refuted. The liberal challenge can be refuted. And we have very good arguments to uh, remain evangelical and follow the reformers in this.